of the uh, Falls Chamber of Commerce and the Board of Directors there for their collaboration with us, the, the city on this event, as well as uh, Paul Nevinen, the Executive Director of the Cooking Economic Development Authority and, and the Board uh, of PETA. Uh, their partnership on this uh, was also very helpful. About a, uh, and I should do one other thing I should share with you is that uh, a good friend of mine who was a mayor in the Twin Cities uh, gave me a bit of advice one time and uh, told me to uh, always be smart enough to know when you're dumb enough to need help. <laughs> and I needed help today and it came without asking. Ted Saxton set up all of the technical here and it's all working which is a great thank you Ted for that. Yeah. A couple months ago uh, Don Ness contacted me and said uh, that his, uh, he and his family were coming up for a vacation and would we have a open evening uh, to uh, talk a little bit about uh, community and I said we would make uh, an open evening uh, during our summer. I know it's uh, difficult uh, to give up a summer evening and especially around Rainy Lake and Rainy River but um, certainly glad that you're all here this evening. If you've uh, picked up a little paper in the last uh, couple of decades you probably um, read about Don Ness and uh, his involvement in the Duluth area. Uh, certainly um, his many years as campaign manager for uh, the late great Jim Overstar, a congressman, and I say great because so much of what we have in northern Minnesota in the way of infrastructure, highways, airports, uh, Jim Overstar got when he was chairman of the uh, House of Representatives uh, Transportation Committee it just did outstanding work for us and just truly uh, was so uh, pleased to be able to work with him for many, many years. Also, uh, uh, the mayors of Minnesota um, probably a little envious of Don Ness because when he uh, finished his 16 years of uh, elected leadership in the Ruth uh, and as mayor, he had an approval rating of 91 percent, and that is truly, uh, truly outstanding. And and he didn't get that because he uh, just shook hands and kissed babies. He took on some real challenges, and so uh, uh, I know that uh, I followed his uh, his career in Duluth, and uh, he really did uh, put Duluth uh, into uh, the 21st century. And, and uh, set it uh, forth uh, very, very well. Don and his wife uh, and three children continue to, uh, to live in Duluth. They, uh, Don continues to serve the, uh, the people in the Duluth area. Uh, presently, he's the executive director of the Ordeen Foundation. And that organization focuses on poverty in Duluth, Duluth area, and uh, that is certainly a noble cause, and again, serving the, uh, the citizens of the Duluth area. So uh, on behalf of the City Council, the Chamber of Commerce, and the Kuching Economic Development Authority, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the former mayor of Duluth, Don Ness. Well, thank you. Uh, what do you think? Should, should we use this? Yes. yes? Okay, good. Um, well, uh, Bob, thank you so much uh, for those kind words and for pulling this together. When I, when I contacted Bob and said, you know, we're going to be up uh, in, uh, uh, in the area for a little family vacation, and I've been kind of working on some ideas about uh, community, and I was, I, I was hoping for maybe a, a group of uh, 10 or 15 people so that all of you came out on a beautiful night, I think speaks well to uh, to your community, that you care about your community and you're looking uh, to kind of find new ideas. And uh, I've always been uh, very impressed and enjoyed working uh, with Mayor Bob uh, uh, during my last uh, term in his office and you're all very lucky uh, to have uh, him in leadership. Uh, and as Bob mentioned, um, I did work for Congressman Overstar for about 10 years and it was, uh, 
uh, really the reason that I went into public service and, and uh, for myself, please come in, um, is uh, Jim Overstar's uh, example. And uh, Jim and I would come up to uh, International Falls on, on a regular basis, and uh, it was usually in, in January, and I'd often ask Jim, why do we come to International Falls every uh, January? He said, well, if you come in August, they don't remember that you were here. Uh, but if you come in January, they'll be talking about it, and they remember that you showed up in, uh, in January. So I didn't follow Jim's advice uh, on that. I'm here in August, but probably you guys will all forget that I was here. Um, and uh, Bob also mentioned uh, the uh, kind of the, the thing that uh, I'm always proud of after eight very difficult uh, years uh, as mayor, we did have that 91% uh, percent approval rating. In that same citizen survey, uh, the streets in Duluth had a 7% approval rating. So that just shows, shows that there's some uh, validity uh, to it. Uh, and the other thing that uh, should, I should be proud of, by it's a little bit of a mixed bag, is uh, for a mayor in the Midwest uh, to be on the front page of the New York Times uh, should be a pretty big deal. And I actually was on the front page of the New York uh, Times one time, and as long as you're not in handcuffs, that should be a good thing. Uh, but in my case, it wasn't such a, a good thing, and I, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about what happened there. Uh, so this is actually the issue of the New York Times that I was on the front cover. I'm actually below uh, the fold, and this was a very important issue of the New York Times. This is Nancy Pelosi with a giant gavel in hand, walking down the steps of the Capitol after the House Democrats just passed uh, the Affordable Care Act, uh, Obamacare. Uh, so it's the sort of uh, New York Times that maybe the speaker might have framed somewhere uh, in her office. I kind of hope uh, that she doesn't, uh, and that will become clear. Um, so why was I? Uh, a few, about 10, 12 years ago, uh, well, it was uh, uh, 2009, uh, Duluth was in a nationwide contest to try to attract Google Fiber uh, to our community. I don't know if you remember this, but Google Fiber was the big thing. Uh, every city wanted to partner with Google uh, to bring them to the town to have this high-speed fiber. And so the story was all the crazy things that mayors were doing to try to attract attention from Google to try to convince them uh, to come. And so the crazy thing that I was doing is doing the polar plunge in February into Lake Superior. Uh, and so this was uh, the picture that after talking to the reporter, we submitted this picture, right? You can see the icy Lake Superior in the background. I'm kind of waving to the crowd. It was, uh, you know, very much a, a celebration uh, type of picture. And so up until the moment that the uh, issue came out, this is the picture that I was expecting to see uh, in the New York Times. Unfortunately, they used a different picture. Uh, this is the, the, the full cover of the New York Times, and if you can see, this is the picture that they used. Uh, and it's uh, prominently on the front page. And uh, I'll give you a, a little bit of a closer look at, at this photo. Uh, so this is the photo that was put on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, pain coming through my face after emerging from freezing cold water. Several chins uh, very prominently displayed. And a guy with a fish in his mouth, also emerging from the water at the same time. And so this is the photo on the front cover of the New York Times, my moment in American history uh, captured. And I thought, there, this is the worst possible photo that could, they could run uh, in the New York Times. But I, I was wrong. The worst photo that they could have run in the New York Times, they actually did run on page A3, and that's this photo, <laughs> which is kind of just as bad, kind of, again, that look of shock running through my face, but also a, a substantial portion of Lake Superior streaming out of my nose. <laughs> yeah, so that is the other photo that I had in the New York Times. So, uh, again, America's uh, newspaper of record. Uh, this is, uh, will go down when historians look back at uh, Nancy Pelosi leading the House Democrats down the line. They'll also see a picture of a mayor uh, from Duluth emerging from Lake Superior in a, in a great deal of pain. 
So, oh, that is uh, one of the stories that I wrote. It's a collection of essays about my time uh, in office, and I do have uh, them for sale today. So here's the deal. I told my wife, hey, I have this idea. I'd love to talk to community leaders uh, in International Falls. Uh, she is at the, 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 um, at the cabin uh, with the kids. I'm here with you. Uh, the reason that she allows me to do this is I said, we can get rid of uh, some of the books that are piled up in our basement. Uh, uh, so they are $20 a piece if you'd like to buy them. Uh, it, it is a, a good read and, and kind of a fun read. And, and I think it's an honest read kind of talking about uh, some of the, the struggles of, of elected uh, office. Uh, so we're here tonight uh, to talk about um, about community and uh, just to give you a little thumbnail I did serve uh, for 16 years in elected office I was on the City Council in Duluth uh, for eight years and then uh, uh, served two terms uh, as mayor and then prior to that uh, current to, to that in, in times working for Congressman Overstar so over the course of those 20 years I saw politics changing, and I think we've all witnessed that uh, in our lives, that politics has been changing, and it's been changing for the worst. Uh, there is more kind of narrow, self-serving, zero-sum mentality in our nation's uh, politics, uh, and we're seeing kind of the emergence of both populism uh, as well as identity politics, and I think that the, the core of both of those is a desire for, uh, for residents, for citizens, they want to matter. They want to uh, to not be ignored, and it's coming out in these kind of divisive ways. And so we live today in a in a both a cynical and divisive uh, time. And yet there is a desire, this deep desire for people to belong, to be, for people to feel like they're part of something larger uh, than themselves. And so while we see kind of a, a very dysfunctional politics in Washington, and unfortunately I think that's uh, uh, being adopted uh, increasingly in state uh, governments all across uh, the nation. I think the one area of our government, of civic life, that still works, that you can engage in, is at the local level. Uh, that you can still uh, see a problem, come up with a solution, and implement uh, that problem. People are hungry for solutions, they want leadership, and they want a sense of, of purpose. And after leaving uh, the mayor's office about three years ago, I was really hungry to engage uh, in uh, a furtherance of this uh, discussion about how we can practice our politics in a more uh, constructive way. And I found that in smaller cities and smaller towns, uh, it is much more possible uh, to move this uh, sort of agenda. And so over the course of, uh, of a few years, I've been in places like Brainerd and Ely and Washburn, Wisconsin and, and Little Falls and Winona, and I've really enjoyed having these types of, of discussion. I hope that we'll have some time at the end uh, for a little uh, Q&A. And what I've uh, recognized in uh, engaging in uh, discussion with these towns is that there's a huge separation, almost a, a divergence um, in, in the health and how people feel about their town based upon uh, the sense of ownership and being deliberate about the sense of ownership uh, in, their, uh, in their cities. Major metropolitan areas, like the Twin Cities, they just have an economic engine, and there's money there that is just looking for a purpose, right? In cities like Duluth and, and in smaller communities, it has to be a little bit more deliberate about saying, we want to create something in our town, and we have to uh, roll up our sleeves uh, and do that. And so I'm here, I don't have the, the answers. There is no silver bullet. Uh, but I do have some ideas on, on some tools and some tactics that I have found effective and op, uh, also some observations and maybe some stories that uh, may and hopefully will uh, be relevant uh, to you folks uh, here uh, in International Falls. And so I start with uh, some questions uh, to, uh, for us to consider. You know, what, uh, what defines a community? What defines a city or, or a town? Is it the infrastructure and the buildings? Clearly it is. The businesses and the institutions that, that, that we often talk about uh, uh, in, in our town that people draw our eyes to? Or is it the residents? And I think all of them are uh, truly the, the case and help to identify. I would say that we too often discount the importance of the activity uh, of residents, uh, of the people of a, a city, in how uh, things come together. 
Uh, and then the question is, is where we live a part of our identity uh, and our life story? Um, in my mind, the place that we choose to live is an enormous part of our identity. Uh, and yet most of us just kind of passively adopt the conventional wisdom about our town, about our, the city that, that we live. And too often the, that conventional wisdom over time uh, can feel uh, cynical or self-defeating. Uh, but again, I believe that a different way uh, is possible. And then the question is, how do we, uh, what is the best version of our community? How do we define uh, our shared success uh, and uh, a sense of, of common uh, purpose? Um, so in my mind, the health of a city is not based upon, you know, uh, one leader uh, with a vision or, or whatever, or the health of, of one institution or one large initiative. The health of the community is based on uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of small incremental decisions, small incremental steps that each and every citizen is contributing to. Like investing in a storefront. You know, and this is the same storefront in, in a small town, and it's kind of a before and after. And what a difference that makes to how a community feels about itself when you're coming into the downtown and you see that somebody has been intentional about fixing up their storefront. Maybe it doesn't, you know, increase their business dir uh, directly at, uh, uh, because of the, the investment, but it does make a difference in terms of how people feel about their community. If your neighbor paints their house, right, invests their time and energy, that oftentimes encourages other neighbors to do the same thing, and it kind of raises all boats. Uh, when folks go back and, and the local employer says, boy, we really need uh, in, employees with a certain skill set, if, if people feel confident and optimistic about their city, maybe they go back and get that AA degree. Maybe they get those technical skills that an employer needs because they feel if they make that personal investment, they are contributing to something uh, larger than themselves. How a community uh, cares for their kids and the next generation, uh, the quality of the schools, the quality of the, the programming, and the volunteering uh, to make sure that our kids uh, have a good experience growing up in our town so that they want to uh, raise their own families here and continue a successful uh, community. And I would also say that one of the most important incremental steps that residents can take is the language that we use when we talk about our, our community and the conversations that we have with our, with our coworkers, uh, with our neighbors, with people from outside of our community. You know, when you talk to somebody in the Twin Cities and say, and they, they ask you, how are things going in International Falls? What's going on in International Falls? What is your answer? And my, uh, the, the case that I'm going to make is that that answer is really important. And if you're not deliberate about coming up with what that answer should be, people will go a lot of different ways. Oftentimes we'll kind of fall back into kind of con conventional wisdom. And oftentimes that conventional wisdom is too easy to be cynical. Right? We all have things that we grumble about, about our town. In Duluth, everybody always grumbles about the streets, right? Our streets are terrible. Uh, it's because we live in a northern climate and we have old infrastructure and we haven't invested enough uh, money in our streets. And so if, when the person from the Twin Cities asks somebody, well, what's happening in Duluth? And if the first thing that comes out of their mouth is, boy, the streets are awful, what sort of message are we delivering to, to those folks? So uh, there's also been a change uh, in our culture in the sophistication of the narratives and how we understand uh, stories. Uh, and there's been a huge evolution in that. And we live a lot of our lives through the stories. And we understand our place in life uh, through stories, whether they're stories that we follow uh, in the news or our own personal stories. And again, to give you an example of kind of the change in my lifetime of the sophistication of these narratives, uh, when I was growing up, Happy Days was one of my favorite uh, uh, shows, and it was a half-hour sitcom, right? And you'd sit down, and Richie would have a problem at the beginning of the show, and by the end of the show, the Fonz fixed his problem. And there was a complete story arc, right? It had a, a start, a middle, and an end within 30 minutes. 
Today, it's a different type of narrative. We actually want something more complicated, and, and folks are giving us more complicated narratives. And today, the most popular show on, on television is The Game of Thrones. And that is a very complicated and involved uh, narrative. And people are drawn to it, not because it follows the, the typical uh, narrative arc, but, but it takes our expectations for what a story would be, and then it moves it in a very uh, different direction. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit, uh, take the opportunity to talk about a uh, Deleuze narrative. Um, because to kind of give you an example of how narratives can work. And this is a narrative that I used as mayor uh, uh, many times. And it's a different sort of narrative than you'd often hear from an elected official or from uh, somebody with the chamber. The typical way for a mayor to, to give the presentation is everything is great in Duluth. You know, uh, we're making progress, we're doing all these things, and here's my initiative, and everybody should be happy. But you know what happens when you kind of do it in that way? People are like, yeah, that's not the real story. You know, that's not what's really happening uh, in Duluth. And so this is the story that I would tell. And it started back in the, from when I was a kid growing up in Duluth in the early 1980s. And in the early 1980s, Duluth had gone through essentially two decades worth of decline. Uh, from uh, the mid-1960s uh, all the way through the 70s. We lost the steel plant, we lost the, uh, the air base, we lost a lot of the heavy industry and manufacturing that defined uh, Duluth in, in its early years. And, and uh, folks, businesses were picking up and leaving our community. And so in uh, the, uh, the early 1980s, these were kind of a, Every day that you picked up the paper, you'd read some additional bad news. Unemployment is high, more layoffs. And in fact, in the early 1980s, Duluth was identified by the federal government as one of the 10 most distressed cities in the entire nation. And so our peer cities were places like Flint, Michigan, Youngstown, Ohio, Gary, Indiana, and Duluth, Minnesota. And there was a conventional wisdom that went along uh, with that narrative that uh, Duluth was a place of, that represented uh, urban decline or industrial uh, uh, decline uh, in the upper uh, Midwest. Uh, this is a picture of Canal Park with junk cars lining the shores uh, of Lake Superior. In fact, that cynicism about Duluth and, and where we, what we had lost and where we found ourselves in, in the 1980s was so deeply ingrained that a business leader in Duluth uh, spent their own money to run this billboard. Will the last one leaving Duluth please turn out the light? Right? That was a deeply ingrained narrative. Now, fortunately for uh, Duluth, and this, this, so this is the story, right? This is a narrative arc. A, a, a great story has a darkest day. The time when you're saying, how would you, if you were put in that situation, if you were a community leader, if you were a business leader uh, in Duluth in the, in the early 1980s, and all the conventional wisdom says you are living in a city that is destined to decline, that is in a downward spiral and it will uh, continue to go downward. And everybody is telling you to leave Duluth, move to the Twin Cities and find something better. But we had leaders in the 1980s and 90s who said, no, we're not going to accept that faith. We're not going to accept what the, the so-called experts are saying about our city because we have too much to offer. We care about our city too much. We're not going to accept uh, that faith. We're going to create something new. And so we turned our attention uh, to Lake Superior. We began to uh, redefine uh, the nature of, uh, of our um, of our workforce and, and our offerings. And so instead of the heavy industry that unfortunately was leaving uh, Duluth, we went to skilled manufacturing and aviation um, and started slowly but surely uh, to change uh, the, the perspective of our community. And yet still, uh, that kind of uh, going through this traumatic uh, time uh, left kind of a mark, a deep mark on people. And we uh, earned a, a well-deserved uh, uh, stability. Uh, and yet when I was first getting involved politically in the 90s, uh, Duluth was obsessed, absolutely obsessed, with how we compared to Fargo and to Sioux Falls and to Rochester, right? And so the newspaper at the time wrote, uh, did like an eight to 10 part series 
that was uh, talking about the success that Sioux Falls was had. And the message that we were supposed to uh, grab from that is that we should feel bad about ourselves as Duluthians because we're not seeing the same sort of suburban growth as Sioux Falls. And so we had this mindset of we were telling ourselves a story about ourselves compared to, an, uh, to a city uh, that was fundamentally different but we, it was ingrained in us that this was, we were somehow uh, um, uh, holding ourselves back or coming up short compared to that. So when I became mayor, I saw how devastating uh, this, uh, this narrative was and said, instead of comparing ourselves to Fargo, because we will never, oh, Fargo, Fargo. Duluth cannot be Fargo, right? We're not in the middle of a cornfield. We don't have that sort of growth. We're a city on a hill. But what we do have is a sense of place. A, a, a deep connection between uh, the people that live there and the, the physical environs that people in Fargo don't have. You know, we have an entrepreneurial spirit. We have uh, an outdoor uh, recreation uh, ethos uh, there that, that defines us. And so we started, instead of comparing ourselves to Fargo, we started saying, Duluth wants to be like Asheville, North Carolina, or Flagstaff, or um, you know, the community of Bend, Oregon, places of a similar size, 86,000, uh, but that are defining uh, our success not through suburban growth, but by the quality of life that, that we can offer. And that became uh, kind of a, a, a change for our community that developed a new conventional wisdom. And uh, that Duluthians now, I think, take pride to say, we're proving uh, them wrong. We have our, we have our own destiny uh, at heart. So this was kind of the, uh, the uh, type of suburban growth that you'll see kind of in, in the cornfields and, and allow it to, to kind of go forward. All right, so where are we at here? Um, so some of the challenges uh, to shared narratives. And these are some things that, that I saw uh, in the city of Duluth uh, throughout my time in, in public office. And I think you'll see some of the things uh, in here that um, can hold the community back. So we talked about the importance of the conversations that we have about our city, right? And so see, these are some of the tactics that people use as part of their own personal narrative of how they are reacting uh, to their community, but oftentimes will have a detrimental effect to what the community is trying to, uh, to accomplish. So the challenges to shared, uh, shared narratives, the idea that we're creating a, a positive uh, new story to tell about our community. Uh, first and foremost is ingrained cynicism. And we talked a little bit about how that was a really uh, in, impactful problem uh, for, uh, for Duluth for many years. And that negativity becomes its own destiny, right? And so for a long time in Duluth, uh, uh, business people would say, you know what, Duluth is a bad place to do business. Duluth is a really tough place to do business, right? And that was part of their own personal story because, and quite frankly, they were probably right. It probably was hard to do business, but by giving it that voice, they were defining Duluth in these negative terms. And so what would happen? Uh, people in Duluth would kept, kept using the same language. Duluth is a bad place to do business. And then eventually they'd say it so often that somebody down the Twin Cities would hear this and then they'd uh, be talking, whenever Duluth came up, they'd say, boy, I heard that Duluth is a really bad place to do business. And then somebody from Duluth would hear a Twin Cities pers uh, person say those same words and they'd say, see, even the folks in the Twin Cities know that Duluth is a bad place to do business. It creates its own destiny. It creates its own uh, sense of, uh, of purpose. The second is the martyr syndrome, and this is a little bit of what I was just talking about. Uh, the person who says, you know, things are so uh, rough and tough in our, in our city, uh, but here I am, and I'm going to define my own sense of personal identity with the dysfunction around. Not to necessarily fix what's going on, but just saying, I'm really struggling with all the dysfunction around me. This is my personal story. But by telling the story in that way, you are contributing to uh, some of the, uh, the negativity that can hold a community back. The third uh, uh, tactic that I would see all the time is the I told you so. And this was uh, very prevalent in, in our community where somebody has an entrepreneurial idea. Somebody wants to start a business in Duluth. Somebody has an initiative 
uh, to, to make a positive change in our community. And then you'd have some uh, folks that come out of the woodwork and they'd say, I think that project is going to fail. I think that business is not going to make it. And why are they saying this in this kind of very public way? So that in their mind, hopefully in three or four years when the business does fail, they can go to the local coffee shop and they can hold up their finger and say, you remember what I said uh, three years ago? I told you so. Or they write a letter to the editor saying, should have listened to me. I said it was going to fail. What does this person accomplish? Nothing other than probably contributing to the sense of why the business failed in, in the first time because there's a whole bunch of people that are kind of rooting for their failure so that they can say, I told you so. This is a negative uh, tactic that can draw communities down. And so what we were doing uh, in Duluth is when you give voice and you identify that these are the tactics that are holding our community back, and then you can kind of call people out on it. You know, the first time that I went as mayor, I'd often talk about, you know, Duluth business leaders saying uh, Duluth is a bad place to do business as a way to tell their own personal story. And by giving voice to the tactic that was holding our community back, it discouraged people from doing it. Because then the next time somebody was around a table and they were talking about, uh, and somebody would bring up that theme, then the others around would say, oh, I, I identify what you're doing here and we're not going to like it. We, we don't uh, appreciate what you're doing. We're going to redirect you in that same way. The same thing that a person who is laying the groundwork uh, to say, I told you so at some future date, if you name it and claim it and then say, you know, this is uh, something that's holding our community back, you can discourage that. Uh, the, another one is the mysterious they, right? And I think we've all heard this one. You know what? They should really fix something. You know, they should really do something about this issue. Who is they? We are the community, right? If you have a problem with uh, what the mayor is doing, call the mayor and tell and say, I want to be part of the solution. If you want to, to, to see positive change in your community, roll up your sleeves and do something about it. Uh, don't allow people to just say they or somebody else should do something. We're all part of this community. Why not do it ourselves? The zero sum mentality. Who gets the credit? Who's in the silos? It's us versus them. You know, we see this in Washington, right? If, if the Republicans are in charge, the Democrats are going to try to stop them from, from succeeding and doing something on behalf of our country. Why? Because we don't want the Republicans to, to pass something that, that is good for our country because then they would take credit for it and they might gain advantage in our next election and vice versa. You know, and we often see this as well at the local level where folks say we don't want those people that have different ideas to be successful because then somehow we lose. And so it's that zero sum mentality that we want to share our success. We want to grow uh, the, the pie. And that's the us versus them uh, as well. All right. So. That's enough of the negative stuff. Uh, but you know, I think it's important that too often uh, the stories that we tell us are kind of these negative stories. You know, when your city comes up and when Duluth comes up in conversation, those were the type of stories that we uh, hear too often. And it was holding us back. It was discouraging the sort of investments that we were talking about before. Why would a business owner invest in their storefront if there's all sorts of negative conversation around their town? They'd be like, eh, you know, it's good enough. Because everybody is, is upset in, in my town anyways, why should I paint my house? Why should I invest my storefront? Why should I hire another uh, person uh, in my business? Because the general sense in the community is that it's not working. we got to switch that so they do want to make those positive investments. And how do we do that? Uh, here's some of the tactics. So uh, the shared narrative tactics, tactics, the symbolic story. And this is uh, one of the tactics that I don't think work uh, that Duluth doesn't do very well. It's finding that small, relatable story. Uh, it could be a story of courage or of character, of love of community, uh, and then the success that, that kind of emerges uh, from that. Politicians love the symbolic story of the little old lady who writes a handwritten uh, a card and puts three dollars in it. And Bob, you probably have gotten those things. And it means so much to those politicians. And it's a story, it's a symbolic story that politicians love to tell. I got a card and uh, the, the little old lady says, I can't afford to give you much. 
but I want to give you these three dollars because I believe in what you're trying to accomplish. And politicians love that. They'll never tell the story of some business person writing out a you know, several hundred dollar check uh, because it's like there's, no, there's nothing interesting about that but the symbolism that comes together. And the idea that uh, the city of Hermantown and other small communities do this so much better uh, than, than Duluth does. It's the story of somebody is sick in our community, right? Somebody is, is falling on hard times. And what does our community do to rally around that family, rally around that person, raising money and kind of doing this big uh, show of, of support? That says so much about the character of the community. And those are the sort of stories that can be told over and over again. Remember how we helped the Watson family a couple of years ago? That showed the character and the strength uh, of our community. The next one is uh, what I call the theory of change. Uh, it's a story that uh, is kind of essentially as we try to create positive change in our community, we say, we have an idea. We believe that if uh, uh, business owners on, down in, in, on Main Street all invest in their storefront, that we can create a, a vibrant downtown and we're gonna draw new traffic and everybody's going to be benefit. We don't know that's going to be the case, but we have a theory that that sort of positive action will result in something better for, for our community. Uh, the crossroads uh, narrative. Um, and this is when a, a city comes to a point where there's two very different routes that the city can take, right? And oftentimes it's, it comes at a point of crisis or a point of, of saying, well, we could go this way or we could go that way. Uh, will the optimists uh, and the, the people that are positive about our community win or will the, the pessimists win? I'll give you an example. This is a, a real example in, uh, in the city of Duluth. So Duluth had uh, an old tin shed hockey arena in West Duluth, which is kind of the, the working class uh, part of town. It's called Peterson Arena. And uh, there was a Zamboni uh, that had some sort of spark and the pro propane tank uh, exploded and the whole arena burnt down. And so this was uh, the remnants of Peterson Arena uh, in uh, after the fire. Uh, we also have uh, just a couple blocks away, this is the old Clyde Iron site. And when I was growing up, Clyde Iron was always in the news about some sort of problem. You know, people being laid off, the plants uh, shutting down, and for about 30, uh, 20, 30 years, uh, this site lay vacant and rotting right along I-35. People are coming in uh, from the Twin Cities. They look over the site. They're seeing uh, this site. Now, because Peterson Arena is a city project and it went up in flames and the city got $1.5 million uh, uh, from the insurance company. And there are a lot of people that said, you know what? What Duluth uh, deserves, what we need, the easiest thing to do is just take that $1.5 million and rebuild another tin shed hockey arena, right? And that's good enough. It's good enough for Duluth. It's what we had before, it's what we can have uh, going forward, and we can get it done. But then there were other people who said, hey, we have a bigger idea. We have a more optimistic idea. We think that Duluth can accomplish more than just taking the insurance money and building what we had uh, before. And they took a look at this site and they said, this is a site that has potential. This is a site that we can breathe new life in, uh, into and do things right. And so they began meeting as, as a group. And they began saying, what if we did this? What if we did that? What if we were able to kind of breathe new life and use these tools and work with our partners uh, to, to develop something better? And, the, and the, there were so many folks who were negative, who were saying, that's going to fail. You don't know what, it's going to be too expensive. You can't do it. Well, today, it's the Heritage Sports Center. And the Boys and Girls Club are in this uh, site. And we have these kind of, uh, you know, two uh, hockey arenas side by side. And this is the old industrial site that was an embarrassment for our community. And now we have visitors from all over the state and region that come here and say, Duluth gets it. Duluth cares about its kids. Duluth cares about the low-income kids in the Lincoln Park neighborhood just adjacent to this that can come down and be part of the Boys and Girls Club and be part of a facility uh, like this. Yes, a tin shed was possible. Yes, that was the easier way. But we had community leaders 
uh, who said, we're going to go out and raise this money. And this was not a public city project uh, led. This was uh, uh, business leaders and community leaders who said, uh, we believe that something better is possible. So the new frame. Uh, it's oftentimes how we talk, especially about uh, the problems and issues facing our community, that then determine whether or not a solution is possible. And uh, in the city of Duluth, we had a problem in uh, sanitary sewer overflows. So for many years, every time that there was a big rain, uh, there would be water that entered into uh, the system and, and created uh, sanitary sewer overflows into Lake Superior. And for many years, when I was on the council uh, and, and before that, here's how the issue was described. You have an engineer that came up and said, here's how inflow and infiltration works. And rain events happen, and if it reaches a certain amount of volume entering into the, the sanitary system, it overwhelms the system, and then untreated sewage enters into it. So that was part of the story being told. And the second part of the story told, you're going to have to pay higher taxes and higher rates. And people are like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to think about this infrastructure. I'll, I want to flush my toilet and not think about it anymore. I don't want my taxes going uh, to pay for something that I don't, I can't see and I don't want to think about. But we're describing the problem in the wrong way. Of course, if you're describing it as an engineering problem, people are going to say, I don't want to pay for that. So here's how we change the frame. Here's how we change talking about the issue. Instead, we said, as Duluthians, our most sacred responsibility is to protect Lake Superior, the greatest lake in the world. And it is an embarrassment for our community to allow our untreated sewage to enter into the greatest lake in the world. We should be embarrassed, and we have to do something about it. You say that you love the lake? Demonstrate that your commitment to the quality of water in Lake Superior by doing something that you don't want to do. Support the, uh, the rate. Uh, increases in, in the, the tax increases that are required uh, to fix that, uh, that problem. And that's what we, we did. So this is the, a major, massive uh, uh, storage tank on Lake Superior. It has a, has a park. This was a Jim Overstar project. It wouldn't look this nice if it weren't for, uh, uh, for Jim Overstar. Um, very much a, an aside, but the, the, the Superior hiking trail goes right next to uh, the uh, uh, this tank, and uh, so when after making this park uh, and saying, well, what what should we call this park? And my uh, idea, because of the nature of this uh, holding tank, uh, and uh, uh, and that the Superior hiking trail was going right next to it. Oftentimes, the Superior hiking trail is the abbreviations are uh, SHT. So I thought it was the Superior <laughs> hiking trail tank. Park. All right. Moving quickly along from that. Yeah. Uh, so the conventional wisdom uh, pivot point, and this is oftentimes I think especially important for uh, areas outside of major, major metropolitan areas, because uh, the big metropolitan areas think that they know what's going on in rural America, right? Uh, folks in the Twin Cities think they know what's happening in Greater Minnesota. Folks on the coast think that they know what's happening uh, in in the Midwest. And there is this conventional wisdom that says, oh, small town in the Midwest, this is your future. This is what's happening to you, right? And they define it in those ways. For Duluth in the 1980s, oh, the you are a mid-sized uh, post-industrial uh, Rust Belt city you are going to be in perpetual decline. And then we say, all right, that's the conventional wisdom that you're telling us. We're going to pivot off of that and use and inspire people in our community to say, no, we're in charge here. This is our community. You don't get to tell us what's happening in our city. We do. And we're going to take inspiration from what you're telling us our, our future is going to be, and we're going to pivot off that to do something better uh, in our community. And then that is also uh, the counter uh, the counter narrative. Uh, that same idea. Duluth is the Rust Belt city. Uh, we're going to create a counter narrative. Rural cities uh, are in. Uh, you know, here's the simplistic idea of what's happening in rural cities. No, we're going to create a, a counter narrative to prove them wrong. And in by investing in that uh, counter narrative, uh, we're also bringing attention to the successes that we have. 
So what do uh, successful shared narratives uh, look like and feel like? They must, first and foremost, be honest. You know, it starts with what people know about their community. Because you can't hide what people know. And in fact, you know, so uh, again, Duluth was uh, a distressed city. We had a lot of big challenges. We still have a lot of really big challenges, and we're going to be honest and ingrain that into uh, our story of how we talk about our community, but then be able to, to evolve the story uh, beyond that. We want it to be flexible enough to adapt to the changing times, and as pri uh, problems arise, we want to use those same stories about how we understand ourselves in these positive terms, and as a new problem comes up, we can say, we can fix this new problem coming at us because we've talked about how our community responds to challenge, how we've overcome uh, past uh, problems, and that's going to give us the inspiration and, and the drive uh, to solve uh, the next problems. Finding ideas that are sticky. Uh, and what do I mean by that? It's, it's the ideas that, that kind of uh, stick in people's minds and that people find kind of interesting and they want to repeat that idea. So when I was first on the, on the city council, I was 25 years old, and we had um, uh, the census uh, told us that we were going, that we were older than the state average, and we we're going to be uh, uh, a dying community in which you know the, the death rate uh, exceeds the, the birth rate. And then we started identifying this idea of the cool factor, and it was kind of cheesy, right? I mean, it's uh, the, what is the cool factor? And there was kind of this question: Well, what is the cool factor? Well, we want to have something that that takes advantage of what Duluth has uh, to offer, and uh, and kind of make it so that young people are interested uh, in, in our community. And so uh, it was sticky <coughs> enough that uh, chamber leaders and other business leaders started using, well, what is this cool factor? How do we create a cool factor so that we can uh, um, uh, uh, appeal better to, uh, to young people in our community? And there was this t-shirt that was made that Duluth is a cool city, right? And, and it was kind of tongue in cheek. And it was a little bit kind of making fun of ourselves, both our weather as well as kind of like this idea that Duluth isn't or hasn't been a cool city. <laughs> Fast forward, you know, 15, 20 years, and now Duluth kind of has a reputation of, yeah, there's some cool things happening in Duluth. That wasn't the case uh, 20, 25 years ago. And so it was some of these new ideas that came about that helped to, to change that. Uh, making the narratives broad enough to be inclusive so that we have common uh, ownership. Who owns the story? Who can tell the story? A good story is something that anybody in your conversations can say, this is what's happening uh, in our town. Um, useful and repeatable, and most importantly, the narratives that are at a human scale and are accessible. You know? so it's, it, and that's the value of kind of finding those smaller symbolic stories. Here's a story of an entrepreneur who moved to town, who bought an old building and fixed it up, and they're doing some new things, and we're going to lift up that person, both to help support the business that they're trying to create and make sure that it is successful, but also saying this is what our town, is, you know, we want this person to represent the good things happening uh, in our town. So the, the choices for community leaders, and this is something that, you know, as, as a mayor, I always came, can struggle with. Um, so is the leader's choice is for a mayor, at least for me, you know, and, and others around, uh, the easiest way to do it is, is to tell your own hero's journey. I am the hero of this story, and I'm trudging through all these dangers and difficulties, and I'm going to lead our community forward. But as a mayor, if you use that as a mayor, that is excluding everybody else. Everybody else is just kind of watching the mayor or some leader kind of go and do everything for it. Well, I wonder if that person's going to succeed or not. Everybody's just kind of waiting around. A lot of people are going to say, I hope that that person trips and falls and makes a fool of himself because I'm just a bystander to the hero's journey because that's how it's being framed. We want to broaden it out uh, so that we're not the audience, uh, but we are the participant. Where there's a success in our city, it's a shared uh, success. And that our personal successes that we have are kind of then add to the success uh, narrative of the entire uh, community. And I have this, this concept of, uh, it's called the, uh, the virtuous cycle of, of deferring uh, praise. And so whenever there was a, a good project uh, that was happening in our community, 
uh, you know, a, a new business opens in, in downtown. I was very deliberate about keeping myself as far away from the praise of, for that as possible. And always deferring uh, all the success, not only to the entrepreneur itself, but as a community, uh, we helped make this success uh, possible. And what I found is, when leaders defer the praise, and people say, boy, the, the mayor could have taken some credit, but they deferred credit, you know what happens most, for, in most times, in my experience, people will give you more praise than you're asking for. The converse is also true. If you have a, a, a politician, and, and Mayor Bob I know is not this sort, but we, we both know uh, folks that are this way, and they're always taking credit for whatever the good thing happens. And we're gonna have a ribbon cutting, and the mayor comes up, and whether or not they had anything to do with the project, they're there cutting the ribbon, and they're trying to bring the praise to themselves. People are getting really cynical about that, right? And what do they do? Finding that equilibrium, say the mayor is taking too much praise, the leader is taking too much praise, we're going to be active in trying to take uh, away uh, that uh, from, from their story. And that's the great equilibrium uh, in, in how people understand uh, the role of, of a leader. So, uh, kind of uh, wrap it up, and, and I hope that you guys have questions, and, and uh, we can uh, uh, continue the, the conversation. Uh, what is the vision for a successful narrative for, for a community? So we want, and again, it's not a single narrative. It's not the one perfect story that we all agree to, and this is exactly what our town is going to be about. It's many different stories that are constantly evolving and, and supporting uh, one, uh, one another. So we want it to be honest. We want it to be dynamic. You know, that's constantly changing, constantly evolving, uh, enveloping in a new and exciting uh, stories that, that add to this sense. We want it to be purposeful. You know, we want to have a sense of direction uh, for our community. We want a better community for ourselves. We want a better International Falls. All right, what do we have to do to make that uh, a shared success? The things that we say, our actions all contribute to that. And as the community improves, we all get to take credit for it. And we all get to take a little bit more ownership in the success uh, that's, that's taking place. Um, so it's starting from what people already know about their community and that it's constantly uh, evolving, it's inclusive, and it's flexible. And so the vision that I want uh, to, to share with you is again, uh, thinking about that out of town visitor. You know, the conversation that you have with the uncle visiting uh, for, uh, for Thanksgiving. Um, or the conversation at the, at the hair salon, or the business lunch, or the conversation at the bar. And the conversation goes to, well, what do you think about what's happening in International Falls? And what are the words, what are the ideas, what are the stories that are being told uh, at that time? And knowing that the stories that are being told will define uh, your community. And we don't have to wait for the Star Tribune to write a feature article about our town, right? That's not what defines how we feel about our town. We define how we feel about our town by how we talk about our town. And if we, if we choose positive and constructive language, we will be building the city that we want it to become. We don't even have to be there today. And in fact, every community has room to grow. Every community can be a better version of itself. The question is, how do we get there? And I can tell you from personal experience and seeing a whole bunch of cities all across our region that you cannot get to a better community by tearing it down. It doesn't work. And yet somehow, we, because I think in part because of the nature of, of the, the political discussion at a national level, we think that that's, you know, well, boy, if, if these national leaders and business leaders are, are using this language, somehow moving our country forward, well, I guess that's how we make positive change in, in our community. It doesn't work, you know, especially at a local level, and especially for communities that don't benefit from, you know, the major metropolitan area where money is just flowing around. We have to be intentional, and we can create uh, our own success. And I'll, I'll end with, with this idea. Um, there's a book, a uh, famous book um, uh, by Jim Collins, it's called Good to Great. And many of you, I'm sure, uh, are aware of, of this book. And there's an idea that I find really powerful and important. And it's the idea of the flywheel. 
Okay. And so uh, the, the imagery that Jim Collins has is that imagine this giant concrete flywheel. Uh, and it has coming out of this, you know, say, let's say it's two tons and it's heavy uh, and it, there's friction on the bottom of it and they have these uh, wooden posts and the idea is that you're trying to, uh, to move this flywheel, right? And because it's so heavy and, it's not, and there's no forward momentum going, when you're starting to push on that flywheel, it doesn't go very far. And you're putting a tremendous amount of time and energy and effort and frustration goes into it. And like, I'm working so hard and we're only inching along here, right? But here's what happens with the flywheel. And this is how he describes it. As you continue that effort, if you don't give up, if you give up, it's gonna go back to zero. It's gonna go back to being steady. But if you don't give up, little by little, it gets a little bit easier. And then you're putting the same amount of effort and it goes a little bit farther. And then you're kind of pushing along and then people say, hey, this flywheel is starting to move. And there's other posts here. I'm gonna get, find a post and I'm gonna start pushing out on it as well. And now you have a little bit more momentum and you have more people pushing at the thing and it starts to get a little bit easier. You know, more hands make the job uh, go, uh, you know, a little lighter, whatever that saying is. Uh, and then uh, and eventually, it starts to get really easy, and now you're just moving, and at a, at a certain point, the flywheel starts moving on its own. And it's going so fast that you have to move out of the way of the post, otherwise you're gonna get knocked down. And everybody looks at that and says, we have accomplished this. We have a flywheel that is moving. We are, we, there's a sense of momentum that we have created, and we're gonna be proud of that. We're gonna be stewards of the flywheel moving, and if it slows down, we're gonna get right back at it and, and, and keep pushing. Uh, but it does build on itself. Success and positivity and optimism feeds the, the individual decisions for people to invest in their community and talk positively about that. And I know that that's possible in the international class. And you know, when I was working for, uh, for Jim, he always loved, loved this community so much. And he saw, he saw the character of this community, and I saw the character of this community. He saw how much people cared about what's happening uh, here. Uh, and he knew that you know great things uh, are possible in international program. I know that, that, I mean, that, you, that you all came out on a beautiful summer night to talk about community issues, I think is a testament that people care about this community. People want uh, whatever the best version of international falls, you all want to see that, and you're ready to, to do something about it. So uh, I'm excited uh, for, for you all. And uh, again, thanks for the invitation to, to come up and, and share a few thoughts. And, uh, and if there's uh, any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Well, thank you. Well, thanks for coming. Uh, to your, your remarks were spot on. In the age of uh, social media, all this becomes really difficult because there's, you know, the voices and where they're coming from. How do you how do you uh, how do you handle that? You're you're so right. Social media has taken these concepts and have blown them up and have made them much more difficult uh, to to handle. But in some ways, it becomes all the more uh, important to be intentional about this. And what we often see in social media is that the negative voices feel like bullies, right? And so somebody. Uh, you know, it's especially discouraging when somebody says, hey, here's something good that's happening in our city. And then somebody comes in and grumble, 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 and now ah, here's, here's the cynical take. And, and oftentimes, you know, somebody says, hey, you know, I think, it's, I think this is a good thing. And, and sometimes that person gets attacked. Well, it is, you know, it's a critical mass question, right? And so uh, when people are participating in social media, they want to get the little thumbs up. They want to get the likes. And if, if you have a community that is rewarding cynical behavior and a cynical attitude, and, and they say, well, I'm getting positive feedback because of my cynical uh, uh, approach, uh, then they will continue that sort of behavior. But it is possible. It takes intention. It takes people that are brave enough to, in some cases, put themselves uh, in the line of fire. But to say, no, that's not OK. What's happening here is a good thing. Or if, you know, our community is not perfect, but people are trying to do a, a, it the right way, and your negativity is, is contributing to all this stuff. 
we'll never get uh, rid of negativity uh, on the internet. You know, it's, but we can do our best to, to counter that and to, to have the positive voices and to be intentional about supporting uh, those positive voices that are willing to take a risk by uh, countering the negativity. Thank you for the question. It, it, it's a puzzle, and I think, unfortunately, that is one of the reasons that that uh, we're kind of going off the rails uh, politically at a national and even at a state uh, level. Uh, but I think at, at least at a local level, because people know each other, you can check your neighbor. Hey, Charlie, come on. You know, lighten up a little bit. You know, we're trying to do something uh, positive here uh, for, for our town. Thank you for this question. Yes. Just as a follow-up to that question. So um, as an elected official, does it make sense when you have people in the community giving blatantly wrong information of things that your community is doing to call it out as as a elected official or do you think it's better to do that from a governmental uh, standpoint like the city of international falls put on the press release or something like that when blatantly wrong or bad information is, is being released i think it's important that, that you address it uh, directly and again, I think that, you know the role of the leader in today's uh, society is to take the take the bullets for that's a terrible uh, uh, take take the heat for the community, right? And so um, you know it was, it was something that um, that I was uh, like when we have a uh, a big storm, right? And people are really upset about snow plowing, right? And so. Uh, and people would start getting angry at the snowplow drivers, you know, and get stories about people flipping off the snowplow driver. That snowplow driver has been on the road for 12 hours. You know, they were up at 3 a.m. while you were at home asleep. Don't give them a hard time. And so I thought that the role of the leader is to go out on social media and say, here's what's going on, here's the story of what these guys are going through, and if you want to be mad at somebody, be mad at me. You know, I'm going to take the heat. Uh, for that because sometimes people are frustrated and they're rightfully frustrated because they're inconvenienced and nobody likes that much snow and and when the snow went onto their sidewalk and they have to shovel it again I get it you're mad you want to be angry at somebody be angry at the man you know and again that same thing if, if you're uh, in a, a, a leadership position and you're going out of your way to uh, encourage negativity towards yourself you know what people see Boy, you know, this is kind of unfair. I don't know why the mayor is getting all this grief, you know. Uh, it's not his fault that we got 12 inches of snow. And they will come to you to your support. And they will bring, there will be voices of reason in it. Conversely, if a mayor comes in and says, uh, oh, here's all the reasons why you shouldn't be upset, people will say, no, wait, I am upset. Don't tell me that I shouldn't be upset. I am upset. Where should I direct this anger? And if I can't, if there's not some place to direct the anger appropriately, I'm going to take it out online or I'm going to take it out on, on the workers themselves. Yes, sir. Uh, Mayor Ness, we've uh, got some major housing issues in Virginia County and the city here as well. We formed a housing collaborative made up of about, about two dozen stakeholders to start to address those. I know Duluth has done a lot of uh, work in the area of housing. What are some things that you did or that Duluth has done, I guess, to address those needs? What kind of partnerships have you brought to bear to, to address those too? Well, I have to say, you know, it's an area that uh, was high on my priority list, and uh, it's one of the areas that I am most disappointed that we didn't make uh, enough progress. Uh, because housing is a major, a major problem in the city of Duluth and continues to be, and there's an affordability problem that people are getting priced out. And unfortunately, as a city that has a lot of tourism jobs, people making close to minimum wage, and if the rents are going up at 10, 15% uh, a year, people uh, at the lower end are, are getting squeezed out. So we're not doing enough. Part of the problem is that the cost of construction, you can't build affordable housing at the cost of, of construction unless you get a lot of government grants, right? Um, here's an interesting fact, and one of the reasons that it's contributing to, uh, to our problem. Uh, the city of Duluth peaked in its population in 1960 at uh, about 116,000. Um, we're now at 86,000. So 20% fewer people uh, living in the city of Duluth. We have 20% more households today than we did in the 1960s. 20% more households today with 20% less population, right? 
Why is that happening? Well, there's a lot of reasons. You know, family size obviously much smaller than it was in the 1960s. But it's also, I think about the experience of uh, the young person graduating from UMD and getting their first job. And they're graduating with 20, 30, 40 thousand dollars in debt. And all of that is delaying what we, even my generation, we could say, all right, uh, by our mid to late 20s, we're going to buy a starter home. And then we're going to start thinking about getting married. And then we're going to start uh, uh, thinking about having kids. Because, you know, my student loans were $20,000 coming out of UMD. That's all, you know, it was a lot back then, it's a lot right now, I'm still paying them off. Uh, but it's different for uh, the, the student today, especially because the rents that they're paying are, you know, $800 a month. Uh, how can you save money to buy your starter home if you're paying $800 a month? You're not having, you know, the wages that you're getting aren't great, and you have this enormous student loan uh, debt. And so everything is being delayed. People aren't getting married uh, as, as quickly. And so you have a whole bunch of single people living in single apartments, and if we did a better job of kind of matching them up and uh, <laughs> setting them on the way, well, that could uh, uh, help our, our housing problem. Uh, but seriously, it is, uh, we have to be deliberate about thinking about the experience of the 20-something today and how do we move them into home ownership. Um, and, um, and I'm not sure what, what the solution is, but we have to be, uh, we have to address the student loan uh, debt that this generation is carrying forward because there is going to be major consequences uh, to our society uh, because, and they're absolutely right for doing this, they're pushing everything into their 30s and now uh, mid 30s and maybe into their late 30s and, uh, and eventually they'll just say, you know what, I guess I'm, gonna, I'm not going to have kids or I'm not going to buy a house and we're going to have a whole lot of folks saying, hey, I need somebody to buy my house. The generation behind having got the starter home 20 years ago so they can't sell the starter home to buy uh, the, the, the next home on, on their way up. So um, major, major problems and I certainly don't have this, this solution. Don, and many of you, I think, have probably read, uh, seen a book called Our Towns, and it features Duluth, and it's a great read if you haven't had it. But one of the um, one of the lessons there I heard was the importance of champions. And could you give Duluth has been an amazing success story, at least in my opinion, having seen that billboard. Uh, did the champions just arrive? Did they come up out of thin air? Or was there, do you have some thoughts on what processes we could do here to bring those champions forward and support them? Yeah, I think it, in part it is, um, you know, it's that sense that there are positive and optimistic people in every community. And there are people, and I think, you know, the majority of you here love this community and, and you want to see things and you, you must love your community to be able to spend uh, spend the time doing it. But there is that sense of like uh, sticking your head up and looking around and saying, is it okay for me to say a positive thing or am I going to be attacked and kind of shunned and say, oh, you're so naive, kid, you know, you can't, uh, you know, the, the conventional wisdom is, is cynicism and if you say something positive, we're going to laugh at you, you know, ha ha, silly kid. Uh, you know, and in part that was, uh, you know, the message that I had um, the first time I ran for, for mayor was a simple message. It wasn't about me. It's like, we believe in Duluth. And so we're, we, it was an invitation to say, if you believe in Duluth, it's okay. It's okay to be positive. Yeah, we have massive problems. We're being sued by the federal government. We have these, uh, you know, uh, threatening to, to go bankrupt because of retiree health care. Uh, all these problems, big mess. But it's okay to believe that a better Duluth is possible. And so that was the rallying cry. And positive people started popping up and saying, yeah, I, I'm, I'm on board with that. I, I think they're. And then uh, there became this critical mass of positive people. And then, uh, you know, the, a business opened in Lincoln Park, and we're all like, we're going to get behind this, and we're going to take every chance to lift this person up because they took a big risk. And then other people were like, hey, I have a similar idea in Lincoln Park. So Lincoln Park is uh, the lowest income neighborhood uh, in Duluth, right? Uh, huge, huge problems with poverty, and uh, there's a food desert, and we had this old uh, little main street that was all boarded up. 
and, and kind of left to rot. Uh, but then some young entrepreneurs came in and said, I have an idea. I want to start uh, Frost River, uh, but, you know, creating uh, bays here. I have an idea. I want to start a brewery. We're going to do it in Lincoln Park. I have an idea. I want to make shoes. Let's do it in Lincoln Park. I have a, I'm a potter. And I'm uh, out in, in the mall. I'm going to go down to Lincoln Park because I want to be part of, of this energy. So it really is. It's the flywheel idea. You know, it starts with a few people. And if you can rally around and lift up those positive people, it encourages others to say it's safe to, to bring this positive energy. All right. So I, yes, Mayor. Certainly education is one of the cornerstones in the community and, and uh, our, our schools here have been successful through the years uh, continuing to send students to state uh, tournaments uh, and not just uh, only in, in athletics but uh, uh, just everything and so and then we have a community college um, I guess uh, Duluth has high, uh, high schools have done well Lake Superior uh, College has done well UND what role do you see uh, education playing in, in bringing up uh, young people in the community? Yeah, it, it, the, the quality of education is so important. Uh, and the communities that invest in education, I think, have a huge advantage uh, for their, their success. And in fact, oftentimes, school referendums are a referendum on, on how people feel about their, their community. Uh, because, you know, uh, we're all struggling. We'd all rather not pay higher taxes. And the question is brought to us, should we raise our own taxes in order to support uh, our, our kids and families? And, and ultimately, that comes down to, you know, do we think that, that growth and positivity is possible? If we improve the, the quality of, it, our, of the education, can we get young families that commit here? But it's also an investment in our workforce, you know. And if we are educating kids and they, they feel good about their educational experience and their, their childhood in a town, they're much more likely uh, to stay in town and to raise a family themselves and to bring their talents and hopefully they've been well educated and they're hard workers and then they go uh, to work, start a business, go to work for one of the institutions in, in town or a business in town. And so that is, it's a long-term play, but it's a really uh, a critical and important play. Uh, and I will mention education uh, in, in Duluth, and you know, there's certainly a lot of assets, and as a regional center, a lot of that is just naturally happening, and we're certainly proud of it, especially the two-time uh, defending national champion, you know, the Bulldogs uh, hockey team. Uh, um, but there was a time about 15 years ago that Duluth undertook what was a long-term facilities plan, right? And so there's a question of like, well, our uh, buildings are rotting in place, and there's all these problems, and we're, we're going to kind of invest new money. We're going to close schools, and, and we'll invest in, in the remaining schools. And that was an important thing uh, for our community to invest in education. But there was a critical point in that, in how that was defined, that I think was a missed opportunity for our community. Uh, because they took the demographer's view of what our future and what was going to be, and they based their long-term decisions based on that. And it was a pessimistic view. Uh, Duluth's population will de continue to decline. Uh, young families don't want to live uh, in the city. They want to live uh, in the townships and outside of, uh, outside of town. So let's right-size our schools to do that. And unfortunately, because we on the on the city side and in the business community, we're creating a different narrative, a success narrative that encouraged young people and young families to be in the city. That now we have a situation in which all the, the schools in the city are oversubscribed, and all the, the schools in the, sub, uh, in the townships are half uh, empty. Uh, and so we're actually taking kids from the city and busing them out to the townships. Um, and so, but it is, a, it's an example of when you feel, you know, pessimistic about your town, you're going to say if there's safety in, in listening to what this expert is telling us about our town, rather than saying, let's create something, a better uh, future for ourselves. So I do want to tell, uh, we just have any, any last questions? Because I do want to tell Jim Oberstar question, yeah, or story. Where do you see the trades in this education? We we're, we're so short of labor and trade people, where, where is that in this education thing about Such a great question. I think the trades are, are really important partners. I always had a really uh, 
good relationship uh, with the, the building trades in town, and I think there, there's a good thing. That partnership is a workforce partnership. You know, it's a political partnership, and there's issues that have to be worked with, but ultimately, I think about it as, as the workforce. And if we want a healthy community, uh, we have to show the path to that 16-year-old kid who wants to stay in our community and say, there is a path for you to gain these uh, tangible uh, workforce skills through the trades or, or going to Lake Superior College, going to the two-year, get your two-year degree and, and support uh, this industry. Uh, we have uh, uh, AAR, which is an air, uh, airplane um, rehab uh, facility, um, and we're looking for A&P mechanics. Right? And, so, and Lake Superior College has a program. And it's, it is a, a frustration to, uh, that we're not getting enough kids to commit to the a program. Even though AER will give them a job, a part-time job while they're going to school, making good money, and then when they graduate, they're going to make $40,000, and if they stick with it, they're going to make sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 a year. We're not getting them you know, enough kids to, to commit to, uh, uh, to that, uh, that field. So the trades are, are really important, I think, uh, in Duluth. They're doing a good job of, of the outreach. In it. And the outreach that happens, and you know, this can be a struggle from time to time, the outreach that happens has to go beyond the traditional, what a traditional tradesperson looks like. It can't just be white guys. You know, we have to get uh, people of color, we have to get women, we have to you know, make sure that the trades and that uh, the industries uh, of the future if we're going to be successful, if we're going to find enough workers to fuel this thing uh, in our in our town, it has to look different. And we have to be very intentional about creating cultures within that that is welcoming, intentionally welcoming on the front end. Because the story that I hear, yeah, uh, we uh, brought in a, an African American and they lasted a week. Oh, well, we tried. Well, wait a minute here, you know. Uh, did they really feel supported? Were they brought in and, and invested in and made to feel like they were uh, comfortable? That is very much an aside and uh, but it's something I feel close to. All right, so I do want to tell, to wrap it up, uh, a Jim Overstar uh, story. And um, I know a lot of you know Jim and, and love Jim. I, when I was driving uh, over here, I saw the, uh, the center with uh, Jim's name on it. And, uh, brought a smile to my face. And we desperately need more Jim Overstars in public service. You know, we need more people whose, whose influence in Congress was not because of the backroom deals or you know, arm twisting. And Jim was influential in Congress because he knew the issues better than anybody else. He understood uh, the issues. He was an encyclopedia uh, of knowledge. And he loved to share that knowledge. You ask him a question, and he's going to go for 45 minutes on whatever the subject was, and he'll learn a lot. Um, but um, here's a, a story of when I first started working for Jim. Um, I was you know, 23 years old, fresh out of UMD. Uh, I looked like I was 12 years old and not in a good way. Uh, and, um, and my job was to pick up Jim from the airport in Duluth and drive him north for the 4th of July weekends, right? And 4th of July on the on air and rain show is a big deal. And uh, we were scheduled to do uh, six parades in essentially 26 hours, right? And so pick up Jim, uh, drive him up. Uh, we didn't really know each other. It was a very kind of tense and long drive. He was kind of, you know, I think pretending to sleep so he, you know, uh, on, on the way up. And then uh, we did uh, Aurora and Gilbert on uh, July 3rd, and everything went just fine. And then I drove them all the way to Chisholm, dropped them off, and then realized I didn't uh, find a place to stay ahead of time. I didn't have a place to stay. And so I thought, well, you know, there's got to be hotel rooms somewhere on the, on the range, but it was the 3rd of July, and so uh, they were in short supply. So I stopped at about four or five different places, finally got to all the way back to uh, Eveleth and uh, found, um, or uh, Virginia rather, uh, was that the Coates? Yeah. Uh, so, and they had one room left. I think it was because it was like 1.30 a.m. and they may have held a room and they were like, all right, kid, you, know, you can have, have this room. Uh, 
collapsed onto the bed, fell asleep, uh, and then woke up with a start, and I had set the alarm to a p.m., or, you know, uh, 5.30 p.m. rather than a.m., and so it was already uh, 7 o'clock, and uh, the parade in Eveleth started at, at 9. And so I scrambled, getting ready, and then flying out the door, uh, all the way out uh, to Chisholm, uh, was about 20 minutes late picking up uh, the congressman, get him in the car, uh, flying back uh, towards uh, Eveleth, and then out of the corner of my eye, I see there's this kind of, uh, uh, 169 is kind of divided in that area. You know, the, the uh, westbound is about, I don't know, 50 feet higher than the eastbound, and I saw this trooper come down and go all the way down that big uh, hill to, to uh, fall in uh, behind me and uh, the lights turn on and it comes up and, and you know, I'm super nervous and the congressman is there. I'm trying to like, you know, move out of the way so he sees the congressman. It didn't work. Uh, so he gave me a ticket. You know, that was another 15 minutes because they, you know, are always very deliberate and wanted to slow me down. Uh, and so we got to Everleth late and usually the congressman is right at the front of the parade where he wants to be so that we can get to the next town on time while we're in the back of the parade. And we were behind the horses, and there, was, <laughs> and there was nobody with a shovel in between the horses and where the congressman was. And so, like, all right. Uh, um, so that was a, a disaster. We get into the, the car and we go over to uh, Kiwatin uh, or Nashwalk. Uh, Bob Fragmito was in Nashwalk. Nashwalk. So then I, I show up to Nashwalk. I'm the new guy. These guys don't know me. All they know is that you know the congressman is late, and, and Nashwalk has this narrow uh, street that makes it very difficult to, to get him uh, in there. So all the activists are angry at me for making the, the congressman uh, late. Uh, we get through that one. And then we go to Kiwatin, and there's a picnic there, and I lose the congressman. He knows where he is. I don't know where he is. Uh, finally, I find him. We get there. And a blazing hot day, finally get through and say, all right, now we have two and a half hours before our last uh, parade in Biwabit, the Cal Parade. And we're going to go to Danita Wright's house, uh, and she'll have you know, refreshments and punch, and we'll just have a chance to relax because we've been running behind uh, all day. And uh, so I'm finally saying, oh boy, this has been such a terrible day, but at least we have this this time. And I'm gathering up the, the campaign signs, and I bring it to the rental car, and I put the signs uh, in, in the trunk, and I close the trunk, and in the corner of my eye, I see the keys in the trunk. <laughs> and I just close it. And uh, back in, in those days, uh, there weren't cell phones. I did actually, I did have a cell phone. It was a bay phone uh, that was also in the locked car. <laughs> so I didn't have access to that. And then you think about before cell phones, before smartphones, uh, if you're trying to find somebody to help you unlock a, a door, you're going through the yellow pages. On the 4th of July, on the Iron Range, and you know, so we're going through and, and calling uh, each of those uh, those names. Meanwhile, the congressman is just sitting there baking in the sun. This was his downtime. This was the time that, uh, that he should have been at Danita's and, and Madison. Finally, uh, we find a tow truck operator comes in and is working on it for about 20 minutes. Finally, he pops it open. We get in the car. We get to uh, by Wabic. We aren't able to stop at Danita's. We're right in the, in the parade. Uh, we get through the parade and then we're driving back to Chisholm, the drop them off of And that entire time I said, I was 23 years old, it was my first real job out of college, and I said, I am going to be fighting. Uh, I, and, and quite frankly, I should have been fighting because of how uh, this went. It was a, uh, a quiet conversation. And as we got closer to uh, Chisholm, I began to say, Congressman, I am so sorry, I just made mistake after mistake. And he said, Don, I'm going to stop you right there. You know, things didn't go your way today, which was an understatement. Uh, things didn't go your way, but you never lost your head, which is also not accurate, but uh, it was very generous of, of him uh, to say that. And he said, I'm proud of you, because we made it through the day. We made it to each and every parade. And uh, because things didn't go your way, it was a much harder day for you. Now, consider at the time that Congressman Overstar 
was one of the most powerful members of Congress. He was ranking member of the Transportation Committee. He was probably one of the 25 most powerful people uh, in the Congress. And I ruined his 4th of July. I ruined his day. And with me, I, I've had other friends that work for members of Congress. In the slightest thing, the member goes off and starts yelling at them, and uh, you know. Um, and the congressman was more concerned about me, a 23-year-old kid that he didn't really know. Uh, and we got out of the car, and I grabbed his bag, and I uh, brought it up to uh, his uh, his doorstep. And again, I, I, I started to apologize again. He said, no, no, uh, we went over this already. I'm, I'm proud of you. And he gives me one of those Jim Overstar bear hugs. Mm -hmm. right? uh, and you know, I'm just thinking, this is surreal. This isn't going to happen. And not only that, but as I walk back to the car, I realize that he is not going back inside his house yet. He's standing on the front porch, waiting for me to get into the car. And then uh, as I, I roll down the window, and he gives me a happy 4th of July. <laughs> and I remember driving home uh, back to Duluth and saying, that is the most remarkable person. And at the time, I thought, well, maybe I'll work for Jim for an election cycle. Uh, but what happened on that day uh, made me loyal to Jim Overstar for the rest of my life. And I, you know, I'm sharing this story because I love Jim so much. I know so many of you uh, love him. But it was, that is a testament of character and it's a testament of leadership because he was more concerned about others than he was about, about himself. And that's the sort of leadership that he has. Thank you all so much. It was great. Thank you, Don, for uh, sharing some of your vacation time with us and, and uh, great uh, examples and, and great stories. I certainly want to thank all of you for coming out. And I think uh, Don said it several times uh, to come out on a beautiful summer evening in International Falls uh, is a real testament to your caring about this community. Thank you for that. So, certainly uh, hope that uh, you'll get an opportunity to be outside and see a little bit of the evening. And uh, if you're interested in a book up here, uh, come on up and we'll get uh, Don to sign it for you. Thank you. Thanks. Good night.